Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm really excited how many of you have already um, logged in here. This is great. I cannot, sorry, I cannot greet every one of you because then uh, we don't have time to um, do this topic. Now, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm from Vienna, Austria, and all my professional life, I have not done uh, anything else but uh, non-revenue water, um, water audits particularly. So the topic of water balance and water loss performance indicators in particular is very, very close to my heart. We had an excellent webinar just on Wednesday, uh, which was focusing mainly on the water balance. So I've changed mine a little bit. So we do the water balance uh, rather quickly and focus a bit more on the performance indicators. I have cut this presentation down. Normally I would like to do a full day workshop on the topic. Uh, in this case, I need, I'll try to stick with to my 45 minutes so we have time for questions and answers later. It is also difficult for me now because I've seen that there are a lot of real professionals in the audience. So for you, uh, most of this will be um, very standard and very boring. So the good thing is I don't see you. So you get up, you have a coffee. Uh, you don't have to listen. For others, it is new and things might be a little bit uh, too fast. So please um, write questions in the chat. And if we don't have enough time to answer all of them, uh, I'll email the, the answers to everyone. Why do we need a water balance? Uh, we have the system input volume. This is the water we put into our network and then goes somewhere in our pipes. And for part of it, we get revenues. This is what we call revenue water. Uh, and then the rest is non-revenue. And most people stop at this point with the analysis. We have 20%, 40%, 50% non-revenue water. But we need to know what happens here in between. So revenue water could be either built metered consumption or it also can be unmetered consumption. So all of this is built authorized consumption. But then we also have uh, unbuilt consumption, which is also authorized. And this consumption can be uh, either metered or unmetered. But the trouble is this unbuilt authorized consumption is already part of non-revenue water. So people are allowed to uh, use this water, but we don't get revenues for it. So what's a good example for the unbuilt, unmetered consumption? This is, for example, firefighting. Uh, in the seminar on, on uh, Wednesday, we heard the issue, so what if I have mosques and they get the water for free? Now, this can be either metered, unmetered, but definitely it is authorized consumption. Now, this is part of my non-revenue water. Okay, therefore, we have another important, very important term, and this is water losses. And you can see that non-revenue water and water losses is already a different thing. Now, water losses can then be split into commercial or apparent losses, which is two things. It's the unauthorized consumption, basically people stealing our water by different means, and then customer meter inaccuracies, data handling errors, and such things. So we do not lose the water, actually. We just lose revenues. And then we have the physical or real losses where water is really lost. It's leaking away, and it can leak from basically any part of our distribution system. Why are these boxes gray here? Because normally if we do a water balance at the first step, we don't know this breakdown. You need to do a different analysis. You need to do a component analysis to determine the volumes of these different boxes. But for the water balance, we stop at the volume of physical losses. How do we calculate the water balance? Well, uh, first step is we determine the system input volume. This sounds very trivial, okay, read the water meter, but very often we don't have a water meter uh, or we have only some water meters, not for all our sources. The meters are old, the meters are not working. 
but the system input volume is the single most important factor for the accuracy of the water balance. We always have to remember this and I will later show you why it is like this. Um, then we need to determine the authorized consumption. We have built consumption, which is uh, ideally from 12 months billing data. If you do a water balance for uh, one month, it's a rather difficult job because you can imagine you read the system input meter, you can read it on the first and the last day of the month, but the, all the customers meters, they are read over the year. So you need to analyze the billing data in great detail. And uh, one of my colleagues here in the audience, uh, Ariel uh, from Manila, uh, he's a specialist in this and he has done it for many different systems. And uh, that's quite a job. If you do it for one year, you don't have a problem with the, with the billing data and it's rather simple. The uh, unbuilt metered consumption, if there is unbuilt metered consumption, most likely there will also be records. And the unbuilt unmetered consumption is something which is nearly always overestimated. And it is overestimated on purpose because the higher I um, estimate the unmetered unbuilt consumption, the lower my water losses, the lower my physical losses. So for example, in, in uh, Australia, the Australian Water Association, they allow only 0.5% of the system input volume. Only if somebody can make a case and can prove that for whatever reason it's higher, he can claim more. The American Water Works Association uh, in the standard M36 software, you can use 1.5%. I personally always do something in the middle. I use 0.8% of system input volume as a standard, and this is always high enough. So if somebody tells you it's 5%, you really need to, to check this and find out what is the reason. Commercial losses, uh, the water theft, obviously we can only estimate. If we would know how many legal connections, we would do something against it. But we need to estimate the range. So for example, can it be that we have zero illegal connection? I talk about um, uh, low and middle income countries. Normally the answer is no. Do we have 20%? No, this is too high. So we say, well, maybe 5%, maybe 10%, and then we give an error range. The meter under registration, of course, ideally we have, we do meter testing and we have numbers for the under registration. Um, but what we also need to consider are, uh, if we have estimated consumption for unmetered customers, that these estimates, estimates can be too low and they are very often too low. So this comes into this box, commercial losses, because if we underestimate the unmetered customers, it is like meter under registration, easy to remember. And at the end, after we have done all of this, we just deduct all of this from the system input volume and we get our physical losses. Um, but then we still don't know how accurate is our water balance. And there was the the father or grandfather or whoever uh, of all of these, these things we are talking today, Mr. Ellen Lambert from England, he had this very smart idea. Uh, this is now 20 years ago, nearly 20 years ago. He said, well, why don't we use a statistical tool to have a look at the accuracy of our water balance? And uh, so he introduced the confidence intervals. And I was, for example, in the at college, I was really bad at statistics. I didn't like it and I thought I will never need this. So I'm not the best in the world to explain this. I made a small example to show you, but 95% confidence level means that I'm 95% confident that an input value is within a certain percentage of the true value. Did I confuse you now? Okay, sorry. Let's do this example. So we have a rather good data. We have a system input volume of 300,000 cubic meters a day with plus minus 2%. We have the built consumption we get from the billing system. Uh, we have, uh, and we want to know what is the confidence interval for non-revenue water. We then add the unbuilt authorized consumption where we have to make estimates. So we give a 
big confidence interval, we like to know what's the accuracy of our water loss number. And then we have even commercial losses, more estimates. So what is the accuracy of the physical losses? And every one of you write down a number, just think, what do you guess what the accuracy of the physical loss uh, volume will be? So how do we calculate this? So the first thing is we need to calculate the standard deviation uh, and we calculate then the variance and we sum these things up and then we calculate backwards. So we do the square root and then the other formula, we turn it around and we see non-revenue water is already plus minus six percent. So how is, why is this? So imagine two percent of 300,000 is 6,000, but 6,000 is six percent of 100,000. And that's why the accuracy of the system input volume is so important. We calculate then, uh, we add the unbuilt authorized consumption, a little bit more variance, we calculate back, we have already plus minus 7%. We do the same with the commercial losses and then backwards. And now we see that we have here plus minus 17%. So this is so important. So we think all our data is perfect, but no, we still have plus minus 17%. Now, how do we interpret the results now? Uh, here, we have, you see the range. And for example, physical losses, you know, it is between 54 and 76,000. So you can say, okay, I can live with this, I can plan, and I know that I can reduce my physical losses maybe at least by 30, 40,000. But I am sure I cannot plan that I can achieve a reduction which is higher than 50,000. But what if now, the system input has only an accuracy of plus minus 10%, then I get a huge range. And look at this. I only know that my physical losses are between 30 and 100,000. And this is the point where I have to say, the first thing is I need to get my system input metering right. I just cannot do anything with this data. And this is so important for us that we understand the accuracy of our water balance. But there's also good news. If you have 10%, if you have one meter, one system input meter, and this has 10% and you have a 10% confidence interval. But if you have, for example, 10 small boreholes, for example, each with a volume of 1000 and each with a confidence interval of 10%, and then everything lumped together, you have a confidence interval of only 3.2. So this means you have much better data. Um, if you don't want to, uh, to, to know how to calculate all of this, you can uh, use this uh, software, which I, which I prepared the first version in, uh, nearly 20 years ago. Uh, it is free, you can download it from my webpage and it does all these um, calculations, they're all included. Um, so the first takeaway is we always need a water balance. If we don't have a water balance, we, uh, if somebody only tells us we have 40% NRW, sorry, we don't know anything. So we need to do a water balance and we need to understand its accuracy. Before we go to the performance indicators, we need to understand a little bit more about physical losses. Um, we have this leakage classification, which the guys in England came up with. Uh, and this is also important to know, most of our nowadays tools, concepts, uh, techniques, they're all based on a lot of research which was done in after privatization of the English uh, water industry in the late 1980s because the utilities have had to become more efficient and they uh, did a lot of joint research. So from these times there are also these definitions. Reported bursts, this is a visible burst when somebody phones in and, uh, and 
call center takes the record, utility sends somebody out to check whether there's a leak or not. So this leak will only leak for a very short time normally. We have the unreported bursts, and the unreported bursts are non-visible, and they are located during, leak, during a leak detection survey. So they are often small leaks, and they run for a long time. And then you have the background leaks. The background leaks are very small leaks. And you will may say, what is this crazy term, background leakage? I imagine this is, um, think of the of background noise. You like to listen to some nice music, but there is traffic outside, it's noisy. Or nowadays in the COVID lockdown, you like to listen to music and you kids are running around and they, are, and they are noisy and you cannot enjoy the music. This is the background leakage. We have such small leaks which are difficult and uneconomic to detect and to repair individually. And uh, this is a, a certain volume of leakage which we will always have. You could call it, for example, unavoidable leakage or minimum leakage. We will always have this. Most leaks are invisible. Now, they don't come to the surface or they don't come to the surface immediately. They sometimes come to the surface after years and years and years. And this is also important to remember. In all the, at least in all the systems I have seen myself around the world, the biggest volume of uh, leakage and the biggest, especially the biggest number of leaks are from leaking service connections and not from the big main pipes. Uh, the absence of an active program to detect leaks is already a good uh, indicator for high levels of leakage. So if you go visit the utility and you ask, do you have leak detection teams? Do you have a program to do leak detection? And the answer is no. Then you already say, okay, you guys have a leakage problem, that's for sure. In general, the small leaks are our biggest problem. But sometimes it's also the big leaks. Now look at these photos. They are from... Uh, Manila, Philippines. On the left side, for years and years and years, the kids were uh, playing and swimming in this water from a main burst and nobody did anything. And they were not happy when we uh, found this leak and we um, repaired it. And on the right, right hand, this is, I think, the biggest leak I've ever seen, about five million liters per day. But these are the exceptional things and normally it's all the small leaks. What we must never forget that the leak volume is a function of flow rate and time. So you need first to be aware that there is a leak. Then you need to go and locate the leak. And at the end, you need to schedule your repair works. And all of this together is a certain time. And for the longer this leak leaks, the bigger the volume. Let's see how big the difference can be. Now, this is a reported mains burst, will be repaired within one day, you lose 75 cubic meters. Then you have a reported service connection burst. Reported service connection burst will leak much longer. First, you are not immediately aware. Imagine it's raining, and uh, people, they see that some, there's something wet. Is it from the last rain or something? So they will not immediately get it that there is a leak. And then eventually they will phone and say, yeah, I think there's a leak in front of my house. So you need to send a technician to verify this. And then you may not immediately repair it because you, all your teams are busy and say, okay, we schedule this for next week. And on average, you have maybe a two weeks leak runtime. You lose 350 cubic meters. But think of a burst which is not yet detected and it leaks all year. So it causes water losses of 9,000 cubic meters for your annual water balance. And this is exactly our problem. So uh, pressure leakage relationships. We had an excellent webinar by Gary. You can uh, watch the video on YouTube where this is explained in more detail. So I need to keep this also short here. Um, when I was a young engineer and had a big project in Egypt and I calculated the, the, the 
leakage reduction with pressure changes using the formula from the books, the Bernoulli equation. And it was always wrong. My predictions were always wrong. And we had no idea what, what was wrong. And then there was a very clever guy in England, a gentleman called John May, and he came up with the concept of the fixed and variable area discharge, FAVAD. And the idea behind this is that a, do, a distribution network, you don't have only fixed size hole. A fixed size hole, for example, you take a stainless steel pipe, you drill a hole, you test it in the laboratory, it's exactly the Bernoulli equation. But if you have plastic materials and gaskets and rubber and an end, then these holes also open up the size, the, the area gets bigger and the, you need to take this into account. So we came up with this uh, very simple equation that you can uh, calculate, you can simulate the leakage change if you know how the pressure will change. But what do we need use for this exponent n1? Um, the relationship is complex and N1 can be anything between 0 0.5 and 2.5, depending on the, on your network, on the soil, on the mix of materials, and you can do tests and measure the N1 factor. But normally we don't have the time, we don't have the means to do this, and I always use as a first as assumption a linear relationship, so n1, the exponent n1 uh, is equal to 1. So this is simple, 10% more pressure, 10% more leakage. A very basic calculation and you, are not, you won't be so wrong because normally what we see that n1 factor is somewhere between say 0 0.7, 1.2, 1.3. Uh, there are also methods that to estimate the n1 based on the mix of materials and the diameters, so this can also be done. Supply time, very often forgotten. Spoke once to a young engineer from, uh, from an Indian uh, water utility, and he told me, we are very good, we have only 20% uh, leakage. I said, wow, congratulations, this is great, so what's your supply time? Oh, we have, we have, uh, two hours every second day. Well, two hours every second day, imagine what would be your leakage level if you had continuous supply. Um, we can say no water, no leak, uh, no problem. So this is the second takeaway. We don't know anything if we only have a water balance and we don't know the supply time and the pressure. A very, very important thing, water balance alone does not tell us much. And now we can start to talk about the water loss performance indicators. Here we see part of the issue already. We have three different things. We have non-revenue water, we have commercial losses, and we have physical losses. So, Frankly spoken, we need three different performance indicators. But what do people normally use? Only one performance indicator. And it is also the worst performance indicator. They use percentage NRW. So non-revenue water expressed as percentage of system input volume. And I will later show you why this is so wrong. We take an example with physical losses. Um, I put this data set together many years ago and I'm from Vienna and proudly can say, wow, we have only a few percent um, physical losses. Uh, then the former chair of the water loss specialist group, our friend Bambos from Lemesos on the small island of Cyprus, they didn't have enough water there, so they had to do everything to be really good. Bristol water in England, an efficient water utility. Then Dushanbe. Who has ever heard of Dushanbe? Not many of you. It is even the capital city of a country. Which country? Tajikistan. Have you heard of Tajikistan? It's a small country, just a neighboring country to Afghanistan. So a country and a city which we, nobody even knows how comes they are so good. Uh, Philadelphia in the US, well we know that in the US 
maintenance is not it's not so popular, so they have, of course, a leakage problem. And then the poor country, Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. Now we look at the difference performance indicator. We use liters per connection per day when the system is pressurized, we come to this. And now we get a much better picture. So the best is not Vienna, the best is the, uh, the guys in Cyprus because they simply didn't have enough water. So they had to do whatever was technically feasible. Bristol Water, private utility regulated by Ofwat also had to be good and efficient. But Dushanbe, 5,000 liters per service connection per day. This was one of the leakiest systems I've ever seen. Uh, but why is the percentage so low? These are these uh, former uh, Soviet apartment buildings everywhere in the city. And in these apartments uh, buildings, they have one service connection, uh, one meter, inflow meter, and in all the houses, in all the apartments, uh, people don't have to pay for water and all the taps are open, water is flowing everywhere, toilets are flushing all day. So the consumption slash wastage in these houses is huge. And therefore, even this huge leakage is a small percentage. But Philadelphia and Ho Chi Minh City, there is not much, not much difference. Uh, Let's have a look at this. The problem is we still haven't taken pressure into account. And forget the guys from Dushanbe because they, they wouldn't fit on the slide. Let's say now liters per connection per day per meter pressure. So we just divide these values by the average pressure. And only now we get the full picture. Ho Chi Minh City, is of course a much more leakier system than the one in Philadelphia. So pressure, we need to know pressure, we need to know supply time. The number of service connections, I never thought that this is a big issue, but in Asia I realized that it is so often, nearly always confused with the number of customers, even in the official um, statistics and data sets. Uh, leakage, but it is important for us because leakage and NRW, we express it per service connection. This is the best, best indicators. So we need the number of connections for the calculation of performance indicators. We need it for cost estimates. We need it for everything. And utilities should identify and geolocate and record in the GIS their service connections. When we start an analysis, very often we simply don't have the data and then we have to make estimates. This is the problem. So you see uh, on the left side, you can have the classical thing, a single family house with one service connection, one water meter it equals one customer. The second one, two customers with one service connection. And this was in a city in the south of the Philippines, where I went to do a water audit and I calculated the performance indicators and I said, I don't believe that these guys are so good, you know, a very low ILI. Uh, and then I realized that they had a policy that one service connection must supply at least two houses. So they, but they told me, this is our number of service connections, but no, it was the number of customers. And the apartment blocks, in the case of China, the situation is that every condominium, every flat has a water meter and is a customer. So you have, in this case, 22 customers, but only one service connection. So if you use now the number of customers instead of number of service connection for your calculations, you can imagine how wrong you will be. Water loss performance indicators. So what do we use? For physical losses, we have liters per connection per day. WSP, when the system is pressurized, so we need, always need to normalize it uh, uh, so that we get a, a value which is comparable. Liters per connection per day per meter pressure. And then 
uh, an excellent indicator, also invented by Mr. Alan Lambert, the infrastructure leakage index, the INI. This is by far my preferred indicator, and I'll show you later why. Commercial losses can be either as a percentage of authorized consumption or also in liters per connection per day. There's no real consensus, and I cannot even tell you which of the indicators is better. Normally, I calculate both to uh, really understand the situation. NRW, we do not want to use percentage of system input volume. Uh, for the last 20 years, we are on a crusade against the percentage, um, but we will never win this, uh, never ever, because politicians and media will always continue to talk in percentages. So fine, let them talk, but at least we shouldn't use it ourselves. We should not uh, be crazy enough to base our decisions on such a wrong performance indicator. We can express NRW also in liters per connection per day or uh, the value of NRW as percentage of the operating cost. The average pressure, surprisingly enough, most or so many water utilities do not record pressure in the distribution network. I don't even know how to operate a system if I don't have good pressure data. In the best case, they go and do spot measurements with pressure, pressure gauges. Um, and if, there, if there's measured pressure data, it's very often at the pumping stations, at the trunk mains, where it's of course always significantly higher than somewhere in the secondary tertiary network. Gravity systems, night pressure is higher than daytime pressure. Also, this needs to be taken into account. And we need the 24 hour average values. So ideally we have pressure loggers throughout the network and then we can calculate the weighted average. Intermittent supply, we only use the pressure data during supply hours to calculate the average. So here, how we deal with the when the system is pressurized problem. You have, for example, a system where you have uh, with a total of 40,000 service connections, you have in, uh, one area, one quarter of the area where you have 24 hour supply. You multiply the number of service connections, 10,000, you get 240,000. You have a big, the biggest area where you have 12 hours supply. You multiply 12 by 25,000, you get 300,000 and so on. And you see, you get an average supply time of 14.3 hours per day. So if your indicator from the water balance gives you 200 liters per connection per day, if you simply divide the volume of physical losses by the number of connections, you get 200. But in reality, your indicator is 336 because you need to divide the 200 by 14.3 hours per day, multiply by 24, and only then you have the proper performance indicator. And this is so often, this is not done and people forget to do this adjustment. But here we are at the RLI, the infrastructure leakage index. And this one number gives you immediately, tells you everything about the leakage management performance of a utility. Uh, it was developed by uh, the first water loss task force before we became a specialist group of the IWA, uh, led by Mr. Alan Lambert. And he came up with this idea of this ratio between the current annual real losses and the unavoidable or the minimal. A certain benchmark and say, look, if everything is perfect, then your leakage will not be more than that. Uh, this is how to, we can illustrate it. You have this unavoidable unreal real losses, the black box, and the gray area is the potentially recoverable volume of physical losses. And we want to uh, see what's the ratio, what can we do to shrink the gray box? We can do active leakage control, we can improve speed and quality of repairs, we can change pipes, but still there is the gray box will be bigger than the black box. And this is the ratio, and this is the ILR. 
So we work together with water utilities from around the world and send us the data sets. And, uh, and then um, Alan Lambert came up with this formula, and which is very simple. So you have 18 times the length of mains, 0 0.8 times the number of connections. Uh, then you have a kind of a confusing factor, the LP times 25. And the, the LP, it is not the length of the service connection. It is only the length of the service connection from the property boundary to the customer. Well, why did this get into the formula? Because there were some cases in New Zealand where they have huge properties. The house is far inside the property. Climate is cold. So you have the meter in the house or near the house. And you have a very long length of uh, service connection on private land. And the utility don't see immediately. Nobody sees immediately if there is a leak. So that's why this factor was ended in many urban situations. In most urban situations, this is always zero. So uh, just keep it in mind, it's not the length of the service connection. And then all of this is um, uh, multiplied by the pressure, by the average pressure. The, uh, then we continue the current physical losses per day. We use this from the, we take it from the water balance, for example. And now we need to adjust for intermittent supply. The UARL needs to be adjusted. So we divide by 24 and multiply by the actual supply house. And then at the end, we calculate the ILI. So you can imagine the best ILI would be one if current annual real losses and unavoidable are the same. This would be here, the black box. You don't see the gray box. It's the same size. Two, double. The current leakage volume is double the minimum. And since all the utilities which participated in this, in this research work were, of course, interested and were good utilities, so we got values or everything ranging between one and five. And we thought if anything is higher than five, it's already very bad. And we had only very few examples where we had seven, eight, or nine. But then we started to apply the method and calculated data set, used looked at data sets from utilities in low and middle income countries. And then we got such numbers, 50, 100. Uh, I have, when we started in Manila, we had around 300. So huge, huge numbers. Um, so I'm not shocked if I go somewhere and, and, and I see the ILIs 30 or 40. Okay, sure, possible. It's the other way around. If I go to India and somebody tells me he has an ILI of only 100, I don't believe it. The takeaway number three is it is impossible to calculate water loss performance indicators without knowing the number of service connections. And service connections and not accounts, not customers. And this gets me to the end of this really very, very short version of uh, talking about this topic, uh, where only the guy uh, who brings the tea uh, knows the solution to the problem. And uh, if you want a long version uh, of this presentation, a PDF, you just email me. And uh, if you want to try the EasyCalc, uh, you can uh, download it from my webpage. Okay, it's the time. Uh, I did well. So we have enough time for questions and answers. Kate um, Stanton Davis is Alan Lambert's daughter. Um, and she said, Alan will be happy to answer questions. This is great. Thanks for the offer. You can also ask me questions because we have enough time. We can also chat a little if anybody wants. Hey, good morning. Uh... Roland, so that'll be the first one. How does uh, economic level of leakage influence the analysis that you do? Well, you see, I will normally work in, uh, in systems where you can work many years to, to reduce water losses and you will still be way above the economic level of leakage. So I have very little to do with the economic level of leakage in my day to day work. Um, at the moment, we are just um, uh, analyzing the situation in Toronto, Canada, 
where it's of course a different story. And, and uh, there we have, uh, they have so much water and it's cheap, it's flat. So the, the water production and distribution costs are very, very low. M more um, recovered water could not be sold. So you can only really use the variable production cost. And then of course you, uh, the, you, you'll soon find out it's not worth to do much, even if, you're, if you are far away from an ILI of one, it's still questionable whether it makes sense to invest in leakage reduction. Um, but again, in most situations, we don't have uh, this problem. We have the other problem that our leakage levels are so high that we have a lot of work to do. Here is a question from Ashok. Uh, Roland, can you let me know how uh, would be reasonable to assume liters per connection per day, typically in India, where data is where no data is available. Yeah, well, good good point. Um, in in a situation like in unfortunately in many cities in India, uh, where we have we don't have the the pro water production is not measured, the um, the water consumption is not measured. Uh, if we if we know nothing, if we have simply no data. Uh, we also cannot estimate anything. Or yeah, we can make some wild guesses, but this has really uh, nothing to do with, with the water audit. So um, I cannot help anyone in India. We need to study this. And I did, I did studies in Kolkata. I did study in, in New Delhi. Uh, you need to uh, set up temporary DMAs. You have to measure. You need to do really a, a, a bottom up assessment. Even this is difficult in India with the intermittent supply. Joe Park uh, question. How do you suggest uh, communicating to customers and politicians about the level of leakage as they insist of wanting to have a percentage? I use the percentage. I, I gave up. I gave up. We had so many ideas. I mean, conferences over conferences we talked about this and there are many many ways uh, it just doesn't work politicians will continue to talk percentages uh, sorry it doesn't work and I have my I have my arguments with Al Lambert over and over again because you know he doesn't he doesn't forgive me that I gave up but I did give up uh, I, I tried now for the last 20 years to convince people not to do it. So I said, okay, fine. At least we engineers, we shouldn't use it. For the, me for the media, fine. So we use better indicators for a, for a certain utility where the NRW is, for example, 25%, whatever the number is. And the media said, ah, it's so high, you should reduce it to 10%, whatever. Why 10%? Because it's a nice number. Uh, what we do, we use proper performance indicators, we use the ILI, we use this, we use that, and then calculate whatever the result would be in percentage. And for the given city X, Y, Z, at the present level of water consumption, the percentage would be, for example, 12%. Now let's talk about 12%. Not a good thing, but I have no, I have no better idea. But Kate, please don't tell your father because else I'll be in trouble again. I won't. I won't. Uh, I won't let him know, Roland. <laughs> I promise. But um, I have put a Thank link you. on onto the Free League Suite Library on uh, professionals who are abandoning the use of percentages. So maybe that might be useful information for some people on the call. Um, could I also could I also mention, uh, Roland, that on the League please. Suite Library there's also a really good set of articles on UARL and ILI. I think that the ILI doesn't show the effect of pressure management. Do you agree? Uh, this, this, is, this is very correct. This is the advantage of the ILI is that pressure is included. So we can compare leakage management performance of different of utilities with very different pressures without having to think about the pressures this is the advantage. But the disadvantage is of course, if I, if I do pressure management, then I reduce leakage maybe a lot if I can reduce the pressure, but my ILI will not change because I've also the, the pressure is in the ILI formal. Therefore, not, there is not one indicator which is good for everything. 
So you need always, you need the right indicator. In this case, you would use liters per connection per day, where you would see absolutely the change what you have achieved with pressure management. Um, um, why in your NRW box you missed the PM, as it is very important on NRW reduction? The pressure management, yes, if you mean the four errors for the, the different things for leakage reduction. But it is not on this slide because it is, uh, because I use this slide only to explain the ILI, because the, the pressure would also shrink the black box, the UAI, and that's why uh, this um, pressure management is not in this, on this slide. It is, of course, in a, in a presentation where I talk about the, the four different pillars of uh, leakage reduction methods, then, of course, we all know how important pressure management is. Still have 10 minutes, but I think we have no questions anymore. Then I thank you all for listening and uh, stay at home, stay safe, and hopefully see you at a conference sometimes next year, wherever in the world this will be.